excited to be with you this morning and to worship with you together as one house, as one body. And uh, it's a special service today. It's first service was really, really powerful. And we know that God is going to move uh, in our midst this morning. He so desires to meet with each and every one of you. Um, so I'm excited for what God is going to do this service. And uh, yeah, Lord, we just worship you, God. We praise you this morning for who you are. Father, it's a privilege to come into your house and to use music to lift up your praise and to worship you, Father. Lord, would you move in our midst this morning, Jesus? We love you so much. Let's worship together.
take this moment, let's just sit in his presence. Jesus, we love you, Lord. Just express your love for your Savior this morning. Jesus, we praise you. You're so good, God. You're so good, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Yes, Jesus, Jesus. Be glorified, Lord God. We glorify you, Jesus. next song I just want to want to share from my heart before we do this next song it's actually an original song um, we wrote it here at Life Center um, and we're gonna we're gonna sing it this morning we're gonna worship Jesus this morning with it uh, we're so excited to do so with you all the heart of this song it comes from John 13 and 14 um, and it, it zeroes in around the table, around Jesus with his disciples, breaking bread, passing the cup, Jesus expressing and explaining what he's about to do on the cross and the power of it. In these chapters, so much happens in this place at the table. Not only that, but you see Jesus he stands up and he starts to wash and then kneels down and starts to wash his disciples' feet. And this includes Judas, even the one who is going to betray him. And continuing, Peter, he, he says, Jesus, don't wash my feet. Like he doesn't understand. He's clueless to what Jesus is doing. And then further on, he tells Peter at the table, he's like, you're going to deny me three times. And even carrying on, he says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you all. I'm preparing a place for you all, and I'm going to come again to get you. So much happens in this moment, and this song, it just really encompasses all these stories. But yesterday and last night, I was asking God, what is it that you really want to speak to your church this morning? What is it that you are trying to tell us, God, in this moment with these stories? And I just really feel Jesus saying, come to the table. Come to the table I have prepared for you. Come, take your seat at the table. You see, then I was reminded of the parable of the great banquet, where the banquet um, planner, he he prepared a feast, and when it was time for the banquet, he invited all of the guests, but he saw there were so many seats that were empty. People were missing. Why were people missing? And he was brought to a place where he's like, go quick, go to the streets, invite homeless people, invite people who are sick, invite people who are lame, invite these people, bring them in. These seats are too good. These seats are too good to be empty. I feel Jesus is telling us this morning, why? Why aren't we sitting in the seat he has for us? Why aren't we taking a seat this morning at the king's table? You are significant. He has a significant seat for each and every single one from you. Don't, don't keep standing. Don't keep standing off to the side. Why don't you see the feast that is happening before you? Come sit. Don't stay down there. Come sit to the table. You are invited to the king's table. So Jesus, this morning, we come to your table. We see that you have prepared a seat for each and every single one of us. Lord God, there is no greater honor but to, be, to come before you, Jesus. You have prepared a seat for each and every one of us, a feast. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. May we no longer let that seat be empty. May we no longer miss out on what it would be like if we choose to sat, sit at your table, Christ. Lord God, draw us to you this morning. 
draw us to these seats, Lord God. We sit before you, Christ our Savior.
died for all eternity will live in his courts a thousand years will sing his praise forever in his courts a thousand years will sing his praise forever in his courts a thousand years will sing his praise forever here at the
an event that happened recorded in the Old Testament. It was such a dramatic story that really showcased a covenant keeping ever faithful God. It had been 430 years his people had been in slavery and probably had no, no hope of freedom. And all of a sudden, he unveils a plan to set them free. And he gives so much detail, but I'm going to focus in on the night before their freedom because this is a foreshadow of the crucifixion. And the night before their, their, their freedom, he said to them, I want you to do three things. I want you to get a lamb without blemish. And he wanted them to put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost. And he wanted them to make a meal out of that lamb. And then he gave them very specific instructions on how to cook the meal and how to eat it. And I'm going to read a scripture about that. So this is found in Exodus 12, verse 11. He says, this is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And really what he was saying is, eat it while fully prepared for the journey I'm taking you on. Because tonight, I'm going to open up a path to freedom. And you need to be prepared to step into that and you know when you look past 2020 into 2021 there's been a lot of anxiety about tomorrow and what it holds but we're not called to think about tomorrow we're not called to know anything about tomorrow except the one who knows tomorrow and he gives us specific instructions today to prepare for tomorrow. So what we are called to do is listen to those instructions. And so the great deception is not to listen to the instructions, but to worry about tomorrow. When Moses was given instructions, he led the people out of Egypt but he never saw the promised land. There was a missed instruction. And the very lives of the children and the animals actually dependent, was dependent on the leaders hearing and obeying those instructions. And so the Lord is speaking to us because there's a time and a season we're moving into as a church and we can feel it in the spirit and we know that there's a shift. And the Lord is saying, I'm giving you instructions. I'm giving you instructions. So you need to guard yourself. You need to guard yourself and stand on my word. And so let's just get in alignment with that this morning. Heavenly Father, we come in alignment. And we humble ourselves. And we tune our ears, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to listen and to obey because all we're called to do is to follow these instructions father when we have fallen asleep wake us up where we have forgotten remind us where our hearts have been hard and cold give us a heart of flesh and circumcise it so that it would burn for you lord that we would be holy as you are holy and father you're raising up a mighty army <laughs> a mighty army with only one fear the fear of God and so we step into that and we give you all the glory in Jesus name we pray amen 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 you may be seated hallelujah God is so good 
Welcome. My name is Toju. I'm a member here at Life Center. And uh, it's always such a joy and a privilege to host you um, on Sunday mornings. And um, if you're here for the first time, we would love to get to know you. So if you go on our website, you'll find what we call a connect card. Please fill it out. Give us all the information so that we can connect with you. If you have any prayer requests, any questions, you can just throw it in there and we'll be sure to get back to you. And one of the things we always do when we gather together is we never fail to thank God for his provisions and, and just for, for caring for his people, but also providing for every need in his church. And so we thank him for that, and we thank him for providing for all your needs, no matter what the challenges are. And um, to give this morning, you can go to lifecenter.org slash give. Um, or if you're here in person and you'd rather give in person, we have a secure drop box at the back. So I have a few announcements. Of course, Easter is right around the corner. So we're inviting you to all our Easter celebrations from April 2nd to the 4th. Um, a lot planned online and in person. So April 2nd, uh, Friday, we have a 9 and a 1045 service. If you haven't registered, do that. Um, and then on Saturday, there's a special online only, a special live stream at 9 o'clock. And you'll find that on YouTube, Facebook, and, um, and on our website. Um, you don't want to miss it. You can certainly go back and rewatch it later. And then, of course, on Easter Sunday, we have two services, 9, 1045, online and in person. So it will be wonderful to see you. Um, you will find all the information you need to register and all of, you know, basically there's a lot happening over the Easter, actually. There's a lot that has been put out for parents um, over the next two weeks to just engage your kids. So you do want to go on the website, look at the Easter page, lots of downloadables, lots of activities for your children. So just go in there and just engage that. Another thing you're going to find on the website is a link to At The Table. How many people love that song? Wow. <laughs> Wow, what so incredible, the lyrics, so incredible. The Lord is doing a new thing. And you know, all to his glory and for his people to press in as we worship and just soak in the presence of the Lord. So definitely go look at that on the, um, on the Easter page. Um, tonight we have corporate prayer, uh, 7 p.m., this is a time to guard ourselves. My house shall be called a house of prayer. So we want everyone to turn out. If you've never attended before, go to the website and just look for Corporate Prayer Life Group. Click join and you will get a link to join the meeting. As long as you do that before 6 p.m., you'll get the Zoom link. And finally, HeartStrong. <laughs> I know you've heard a lot about Heart, HeartStrong over the last few weeks, but guess what? Launching on Thursday. So Thursday, April 1st, HeartStrong is going to be launched. And if you have registered, you will get an email. All the information you need will be in it. If you've been thinking about registering, well, you want to go ahead and do that. So you get that information in your inbox. And if you're not quite sure, you know, you need some more information, well, there's an information session actually this afternoon at 2 p.m. So if you go to the website, you'll be able to get uh, access to the link there and show up at the meeting. So without further ado, um, there is a slide. We have a video um, talking about HeartStrong, and then we get to hear Pastor Barry preach an incredible message, which um, I got a sneak peek at. So you're going to be truly blessed. God bless you. As my morning alarm sounds, I hear a voice whisper, it's too early, too cold, too dark. You can start tomorrow. But I'm not the author of tomorrow, and all I have is my part to play in today. It's time to wake in the dark so that we may walk in the light, by faith and not by sight. You see, our enemy is on a mission to steal, kill, and destroy, and it is much easier to rob a home when the owners are asleep. So we must run faster, fight harder, casting off our old self and allowing God to transform us into something new. But nobody said this would be easy. We must boldly take our place, fully awake to the schemes of our enemy and the promises of our God, who has already declared the victory. 
The alarm is sounding. The war rages outside, all around, and within. Let us put on the full armor of God, stepping out in the strength of our Lord, rising in boldness and ready to fight. Amen. Let's all stand together for a second. You ready? Take your hands in front of you and go like this. All right, a little jogging. Come on. Are you ready? All right, lift your hands to heaven. Father, thank you for what you're about to do in our midst. We honor you, we bless you, we worship you, and we wait on you. Speak to our hearts, change our lives for Jesus' sake. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I just want to say before we get started, number one, it's always a joy to have the opportunity to share God's word and to do it in your home church. And uh, thank you, Jason and Lori. This is an honor for me. Thank you all for coming this morning. Thank you to the team that works behind the scenes and in front of the scenes and all the stuff that goes on to make a service a service. We are very grateful for the people who make that all possible for us. Today we're going to look at the story of Palm Sunday called the Triumphal Entry. The four Gospels talk about what happened when Jesus makes his move to head into the city of Jerusalem and the people gather and cut down palm branches and take their cloaks, lay it in front of him, and they begin to sing and to praise and to worship him. I want you to stop and think of that for just a moment. What's going on in heaven as Father's Son is being celebrated? I believe it put a smile on the face of God. That my son is being praised, my son is being worshipped, my son is being honored, he's being celebrated in the midst of my people. That's a wonderful moment for God. But think about Jesus as well. For so many seasons of his journey, he has said, say nothing, tell no one. He's made them be quiet, and now he is celebrating as he's riding into the city the praises of the people. So there are dynamics in the seasons of God, in the timings of God, in the purposes of God. And as he moves in, you and I have two things that we can look at. One is the tradition of Palm Sunday, and we can just celebrate the tradition of it and go through the motions every year, or we can understand the storyline and the truth of what's really taking place. We're going to see in a moment that when you understand the Scriptures... And you understand that when God created humanity, he created us in his image and in his likeness. We can praise him. The animals can't. But you and I can. I know Fufu's a wonderful pet and you love Fufu, but when Fufu dies, it goes in the ground. When you and I die, we stand before the Lord. And the condition in which we die, we are either invited in to the table or we are said, depart from me, I never knew you. That's the seriousness of why Jesus is going to do what he's going to do heading into the city. When Adam and Eve were created, God said to them, I'm going to create you in my image and in my likeness, which means we're going to take on a spiritual characteristic of God. And we're going to be able to worship him, have fellowship with him. But something went wrong in the process and we're introduced, obviously, to Lucifer. We're introduced to a serpent in the garden who tempts Adam and Eve, and they sin against God. And there was a death penalty that hung over them if they committed sin. And we have to understand that Christianity is not just another religion. It's not just another story. It's God's story for human beings to understand why they're here, what it's all about, how we live our lives. And we've heard the expression before that when you know origins and you know meaning and you know morality and you know destiny, then you live your life in a certain way. For a lot of people, they just kind of go through the motions and they will tell you when you're dead, you're dead. It's all over. There's, there ain't no more. They're believing a wrong story. And so we believe a story that helps us appreciate why Jesus takes this moment to receive the praise of the people and yet set his face like flint to go into the city and accomplish all that the Father has established for him. So when you understand that, 
that if you die in your sins, there's a death penalty over your life. And here's what it says in John chapter 3 and verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. We learn that in Romans as well, that government carries responsibility and it carries wrath when we do things wrong or break the law. And so when people break the law in the natural, they have to pay a penalty. When you break the law in the spirit, you pay a penalty. And how do we know that we've broken the law? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when that's at work inside of you, then this is no longer a tradition. This is a reminder and a celebration of what the triumphal entry is all about. It's appreciating the stewardship of what Jesus has in his life for the 33 short years that he spent on this earth, the stewardship of all that the Father had trusted him, and he was found as a faithful steward. What about you? What about me? We have a stewardship as well. God has entrusted our life to us, and he wants to be at work in us that we can glorify him and make an eternal difference through our lives. And so Palm Sunday in the four Gospels shows this amazing celebratory moment where Jesus rides in on a colt into the city of Jerusalem. He's going to teach us and demonstrate through this story that from the very beginning to this moment that God is for us. Aren't you glad? He's going to show us even in his incarnation that God was willing to come in human form and do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He showed us that he was for us when he became a baby in the city of Bethlehem, the place where the Passover lambs were born and nurtured and cared for. And Jesus was born in that community. It's going to show us that God is for us in the person of Jesus, who on one hand holds back the wrath of God, and on the other hand welcomes us and invites us to come follow him. That's a, that's a challenge when you look at this person, Jesus, because he is God manifest in the flesh. And then he's going to show us how much he loves us in the future. He's going to come as a groom for us as his bride. God is for his church. He's for his bride. And he's going to bring us into his millennial reign, and we're going to rule and reign with him. But in the triumphal entry, not yet. It's going to come in the future, and he's going to be with us for all eternity in the eternal kingdom. And so followers of Jesus believe in the inspiration of Scripture. We accept what it says by faith because we trust the God who spoke it. And Scripture says in 2 Timothy, all Scripture is breathed out or by inspiration of God, is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, instruction, and training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete. How many want to be complete? How many want to grow up, be conformed to the image of Jesus? No, Pastor, I just want to stay the way I am. No, you want to grow. You want to be everything he wants you to be and equip you for every single good work. That's why your life is a stewardship of all that God invests inside of you. Palm Sunday is attested to by historians and gospel writers, and we see Jesus seated not on a white horse, not on a horse that stands hands above every other horse, like a king coming into the city and declaring his victory over the city, but he comes in on a colt, which is a foal of a donkey. It's even up smaller than a donkey. So some scholars have said when Jesus sat on the colt, his feet were dragging on the ground. That's how low this colt was. And what's he demonstrated? He is lowly of heart. He is coming into the city, being greeted by the pilgrims to serve them, to help them understand that the God that they serve is a God that is for them and not against them. Let's read it in Mark chapter 11. It'll come up on the screen. When they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, 
Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt. It's tied. No one has ever sat on it. What's he doing? He's using the word of knowledge to be able to help them know what to look for. And when you listen to uh, what is taught about Bethany and Bethpage, they are just little suburbs of the city of Jerusalem, but they are up towards the top and the back part of the Mount of Olives. And so he's giving them very specific instructions. And he says, untie it, bring it to me. If anyone says, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. How many times have you read the Bible where you've seen that expression that Jesus has a need? He didn't come to be served. He came to serve to care for people. But there was another instance where he was with a woman at a well, and he said to her, give me a drink. He was thirsty. He wanted a drink, but she wanted a conversation. And they got into a conversation, and she certainly had her life totally changed, and he didn't get a drink. So here he is now saying he wants a colt, and they go and get him the colt, and they're going to bring it, and he said, if there's any problem with this one, you just tell them the Lord has need of it. Now, in Bethany and Bethpage, they would have understood who the Lord was. They would have understood Jesus because living in those communities was Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, also Simon, the former leper. They went and found the colt, tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to him, what are you doing untying the colt? And he told them what Jesus had said to them, and they let it go. And they brought the colt, so Jesus, and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread their leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before him and those who followed were shouting. Say it with me. Shouting. You, you can say that under your mask. Shouting. They were shouting, they were declaring, they were celebrating, they were honoring. They had great expectations at that moment, and they were making their praise known. And Jesus hears it, Jesus sees it, and Jesus experiences it. And that's to honor the Father for the stewardship of what he's been entrusted to bring redemption, to take that wrath, that curse that was on humanity, and lift it off every individual that would receive him. And so they begin to say, blessed is he who's coming in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And even those that are representing the Davidic kingdom. And when he looked around at everything as it was late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. He didn't sleep in Jerusalem. He went back to Bethany where his friends were. And Jesus demonstrated this incredible need in his life to have a cult to fulfill this because in a moment we're going to see there is something in the book of Zechariah that prophesies what you need to look for when you are considering who might be the Messiah. Not only has he been healing the sick and raising the dead and doing all these wonderful things, but there are going to be a number of other things that he's going to do that when you put that all together, all those pieces in the puzzle, you will see that he is the Messiah. He rides down the three-kilometer steep slope of the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley, and he's going to enter into the eastern gate or what's called the Golden Gate. It is a prelude to him doing it again. He's coming the first time in a lowly manner as the Prince of Peace, but he will come a second time. And so the Jewish Passover that started last night here in our city and, and goes through this week, it always has significance to it. Number one, in the month of Nisan and the 10th day, which is a March or April for us, it's when the Passover lambs were selected. And these were the ones that were perfect, the ones that were spotless, the ones were then paid for and brought into a family, and they spent four days with the family. And so that little lamb became a very precious commodity amongst the family, and I'm sure the kids really enjoyed it until it became the 14th day of Nisan. And then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you cut its throat. How many know if that was foo-foo, we'd be in trouble? 
But that's what takes place, and then they would partake of that lamb. They would cook it and eat it, so it would become a part of them. So Passion Week, we call it, as Jesus comes into the city, touches a number of things that are really important. When he arrives at Bethany and Bethpage, he doesn't go from there for a while. He takes time to rest. The disciples have walked the 27 kilometers from Jericho, and a man that has been in Jericho that has been blind most of his life, Bartimaeus, is completely healed. And so the disciples are just inundated with pilgrims and crowds and all of the people because they're walking the same route that everybody else would walk to go into the city and celebrate the Passover. And so he sleeps in Bethany and enjoys company with Mary and Martha and those that are there. And then he's going to march in the following day into the city of Jerusalem, calling the triumphal entry. He's going to cleanse the temple. Now, can I just give a prophetic word for a minute here? He's going to cleanse the temple because the people are railing against Rome, railing against the government, railing against everything, and he stops them and he says, give me a coin. And he takes the coin and he says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Why? Because God establishes government. And government will be responsible to God for their stewardship. Just step back. And then he says, render to God the things that are God's. So you and I live heavenly minded, but earthly good. And it's a tension that we carry. What's Jesus doing? He is putting to rest every conspiracy theory of that day. And he's saying to them, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Put your eyes on me, focus on me, and you will find yourself in Father's favor. That would have turned some tables and rallied some people and reviled other people and turned things upside down, but he knows what he's doing and he knows why he's doing it. Now back it up again and say to yourself, didn't Jesus say I don't do anything on my own account? Everything I do, I see my father do. He saw his father turning over tables in heaven as an example of what he needed to do when he went into the temple. And he said to them, you have made this place a place of merchandise and a place of buying and selling, and it is meant to be a house of prayer for all the nations. Now that would have cut to the quick. And then he says to them, in the midst of all of that, I'm going to leave now and I'm going back to Bethany. So imagine what he left. A whole bunch of angry Jewish people. Priests and scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, they were just incensed at him. He didn't win any friends and influence people that day. He goes back, and as he's going back, he comes to a fig tree. He's hungry. He wants to get some figs. There are no figs. He curses the fig tree, and I'm sure people are kind of wondering, what's he up to? And he heals some sick people, and he goes and has a meal at his home in Bethany with his friends. Next day, he leaves and heads back to Jerusalem, and when he does, they all see the fig tree that he cursed, and it's completely withered. And they're thinking in their hearts, we understand figs. We know how to grow this stuff. It doesn't die overnight. What's going on? And he teaches them about faith. He teaches them about declarations. He teaches them in such a way as they have a natural example of a spiritual truth right before their eyes. And then he goes into the city, heals the sick, ministers, does what he does, and uh, leaves again. By Thursday, he tells his disciples that it's time to have the Passover meal. You and I know from Mark chapter 14, we'll see it in Mark chapter, sorry, John chapter 12. We know that as he is doing what he's doing, what's in his mind is I want to have a last meal with my disciples. 
We've heard it in the song already. I want to invite them to the table. I want to wash their feet. I want to prepare their hearts for what they're going to go through. And so he does that. And here's what it says in John 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus had come to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. And they gave a dinner for him, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. So we talked about that briefly, and while he's there... Mary takes this beautiful ointment that she has been saving up that is very expensive nard, the the scriptures say. And while he's reclining at table, she takes it and pours it over him. And then she begins to dry his feet with her hair. And some that are even gathered in that close environment get upset with her. Why is she doing that? And Jesus stops them. Aren't you glad that sometimes there are people who love Jesus more than you do? And you get offended by what they're doing, but Jesus says, just let them continue to praise me. Just let them continue to love me. And she's loving Jesus and honoring Jesus in the midst of this meal that they're sharing together. And Jesus says, she has anointed me for burial. Now, The disciples hear, but they don't hear. Do you remember when you were in school and you went to physics class and you heard, but you didn't hear? I heard everything the teacher said, but I didn't understand anything the teacher said. And the disciples are in that same situation. They're hearing Jesus say these things, but they can't put it together yet. They will later, but they can't put it together yet. And so she's she's anointing him for burial. And according to the Gospel of John, when Jesus leaves Bethany again and goes back into the temple, he's going to go in, he's going to have a meal together with his disciples, and everyone who has been a part of the journey this week already in this story is going to play right into the purposeful hands that God has drawn for them. His foreknowledge allows his son to go into Jerusalem to eventually die on a cross. But at this point, the Romans are incensed, the Jewish leaders are incensed, and they want to take it out on somebody. There's two People that can be crucified that day, one is Barabbas and one is Jesus, and guess who they choose? Barabbas. Go free. Jesus, you die. So even those kind of situations are part and parcel of the picture of Palm Sunday showing us what's coming so that when you start putting everything together, you and I are the Barabbases. We live our lives absolutely doing whatever we want to do until we come to the realization that there's a death penalty over our lives and we need this Jesus who paid the penalty for our sin. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, is our Passover lamb, and he has been sacrificed. And so Thursday evening as they're eating the meal together in the upper room, Jesus does the same thing that night that he did with the colt a few days earlier. In Mark 14, he says to a few disciples, go into the city. There'll be a man carrying a jar of water. You'll meet him, follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says. They knew who the teacher was. Where is my guest room that I meet the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples went out into the city, found it just as he told them, and they prepared the Passover. Good stewardship. Do what Jesus says to you to do. Good stewardship. Align your life to what it is he's calling you to do. Good stewardship. No surprises for Jesus. In this moment, as he honors and sets his face to fulfill the Father's plan of redemption, he tells the disciples what he's about to go through now, again, in Jerusalem. He told them in Bethany, she's anointed me for burial. Now he's telling them in Jerusalem, see, we're going to go up, and the Son of Man's going to be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. 
They're going to condemn me to death, deliver me over to the Gentiles. They're going to mock me, spit on me, flog me, and kill me. But after three days, I will rise again. Where did they go from the upper room? Just after hearing this, they go to Gethsemane. They go to this place at the base of the Mount of Olives where they're going to pray and they're going to seek God. And Jesus said, just pray. Pray with me for just an hour, guys. This is heavy. There's a lot going on here. Just pray with me. And what do they do? They fall asleep. Could you imagine what's going on in the mind of Jesus as the enemy starts attacking him? Some disciples you have. They can't even stay awake. You've told them everything you're going to go through, and they're not even supporting you. But Jesus doesn't depend on the disciples. He depends on his Father. That's what gives him strength in everything that he's going through. He loves his disciples. He loves you and I. He brings us into his presence, all of that, but his dependence is on the Father. And he even reminds them of a prophecy in Zechariah 9 that says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coal, the foal of a donkey. So all the pieces are being put in. And what happens in the disciples' lives? They run away. They're, they're, they're falling asleep. They're not engaging the process. At that moment, their stewardship is being questioned. But Jesus understands the Father's will will be accomplished no matter the circumstances that he has to go through. In fact, in Zechariah 13, I hope I get it right this time, he says, I will strike the shepherd and I will scatter the sheep. And so Jesus knows this is a strike that's coming, scattering the sheep, but the purpose keeps moving forward through the shepherd that has been struck for the purposes of God. So his role as Messiah now is not hidden off away in a corner somewhere. His role as Messiah now is as public as public can be. And that's why when you see the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the things that Jesus did in Jerusalem during this week, it would take a callous, hard, deceitful heart to not recognize who it is that is in their midst. He has come into his home, the house of God in the city of Jerusalem as their Passover lamb in the same way that all of them have bought a Passover lamb and have it in their home. The recognition must be there. And so whether it's a palm branch, a cloak, a shout of praise, Scripture being fulfilled, the declarations that he's the son of David, the Messiah is here, he has come, he's in our midst, all of that is taking place and Jesus is like flint focused on what he's called to do and what he's going to do. And so under pressure, under various unmet expectations, the crowd somehow gets disenchanted with this Jesus. And even though the priests are leveling a charge at him and uh, saying that he is not who he says he is and he's blasphemed against God, some of these people who put the cloaks on the ground and waved the palm branches and shouted hallelujah, shouted even the word hosanna, which means rescue us, save us. And as he comes into the city, that's exactly what he's doing. And now in their hearts, they're saying, crucify him. How many know that God knows that we're just dust? And that our opinions can change pretty quick. So our dependency is on him, not on us. He's for us, and he understands what's taking place, and he keeps moving forward. And here's two things I want you to take away. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
to the glory of God the Father. There is no accidental event going on during Palm Sunday leading to the crucifixion. There's nothing going on that's coincidental or accidental. Everything is perfectly planned. He's embraced his calling as a good steward, even though he knew the outcome would be death. He knows his closest disciples are going to desert him, and one of them is going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver, but he's still going to wash his feet. He's still going to feed him. He's still going to care for him. He's still going to love him. God loves us. He is for us. The challenge has to be, will we be for him? Will we love him? Will we praise him with our lives? And even though his own reject him, they can't stop him. Palm Sunday events show us the exact nature of what God knows in advance. There are no surprises to him. He has full foreknowledge of what is taking place. He is in control, and he directs the events because he knows the end of the story. Do you know the end of the story? Because once you know the end of the story, you can go through hell on earth and come out the other side faithful to God. Doesn't matter what you have to go through. You can stand up and praise him in the midst of a crowd that are saying crucify him. There's a picture in the Second World War of thousands of peoples raising their hands and saying, Hail Hitler, and there's one man standing there with his arms folded. That man understood something of what was going on around him and said, I'll have no part of that. For you and I as Christians, you and I as followers of Jesus, when it's time to praise him, we praise him. When it's time to express glory and honor to him, we do that. And when we get out of the sanctuary, out of the house, and into the culture, and things go all haywire, we can in the midst of that just stand firm and say, Jesus... Nothing has changed. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. My confidence is not in myself. My confidence is in you. You showed me what stewardship was like. You showed me the Father's love for me. You showed me salvation. You showed me rescue. You showed me everything that I would ever need, and you even took the penalty off my life. I am no longer under wrath. I am full of life eternal. So, Jesus, I'll do whatever it is you ask me to do. The second part I want you to take away is that sometimes he doesn't meet our expectations. Sometimes you have to go things where even though the hidden motives of men's hearts are revealed, he doesn't always meet the dreams and the expectations and the things that are going on inside of us the way we would want them to go we have to trust his plan. And we have to be able to say, Lord, when you came into the city, you didn't come in as a conquering military leader, but you came in as a suffering servant. The end of the story had not been written yet in terms of understanding what was going on. But you came in to do this in the purposes of the Father that it would eventually be recorded for all of us to know that you came serving us. And we have an obligation to serve our generation. We have an obligation to serve our city, serve our family, be a blessing to people, and understand that if God is for us, nothing and nobody can be against us. He came the first time as a prince of peace, as I said a moment ago. He came bringing the only sacrifice to set humanity free from the death penalty that was imposed by the Father in the garden. So if there's anyone that we should fear, and I mean that in a reverent way, it's God. Because he holds the keys. Satan doesn't. God does. And so the penalty that is upon us, Jesus said, Father, I will pay that penalty. I will give my life as a ransom for many. I will do for them what they cannot do for themselves. Because even if Adam would have stepped forward and said, uh, well, Lord, um, I'll die on behalf of Eve. 
God would have said to him, you'll die in your sin if you do that because you're a sinner. You have violated my will. You have violated my command. You've broken my law. Therefore, the death penalty is on you. If you die in your sin, you will be separated from me. Now, here, the God for us moment. I don't want you separated from me. I want you to be with me where I am so I have a plan to draw you to myself. And that plan unfolds all the way through to this triumphal entry into the city and in the midst of expectations that are wonderful and expectations that are dashed in terms of hopes that are realized and hopes that are deferred, Jesus stays the same. And you and I say yes to him, and when we say yes to him, we too can enter into that crowd on that day celebrating him for who he is, what he did, and that we're participants of it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Pastor Jason. And everyone said... Amen. Together, let's stand and pray. Let's put our hands out in front of us at home. You can type amen in the chat. You're right with us. It's so beautiful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, together we just pull on the threads that have been just revealed to us today, evident to us today. Father, the first thread that you are faithful whenever we are faithless. And so, Father, we anchor in you, not in ourselves. Father, we come to your table, your table of conviction, but you're also your table of setting us free. Your table where you reveal things, even about ourselves that we don't like, but you reveal them to heal them, that there's a greater purpose in why you're doing what you're doing. And so, Lord, we don't push back from the table. Father, we come right to it and allow you to love us as you need to. Together, Father, we thank you that when we look at the story of Easter, we can see with specificity that your plan is perfect. That what you do, Father, each step, that there's not one detail, not one I or one T that wasn't crossed or I that was dotted, Father, because that's what love looks like. And so, Jesus, may we see not just detail, but may we see a Father who cares about even the very little things, not just of our hearts and lives, but of the world in which we live. And Father, now as we go into this week, as we go into Holy Week as your church, Father, whether it's on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, or of course Thursday as we've heard today, the story unfold. Father, may we root and abide in you. Father, may we worship you and may we recognize today that to save us was going to cost you way more than we could see. Lord, for you to bring salvation as a gift to us, free to us, was going to cost you everything. And lastly, Father, I pray, together we pray, that as we go into this week, leading, of course, till next Sunday, which is Resurrection Sunday, Father, I pray that you'd give us the grace to live in each part of the story, to not just run to next Sunday to celebrate, and oh, what a victory it is, but Father, let us anchor in root in each part of the story so that we can see that you are truly for us, that you're not against us. But there may be things in us that are against what you're going and trying to do. And so, Father, deal with your church. Deal with our hearts. Lord, I pray, get our eyes off of trying to fix the world and get the world out of your church, God. Let us be, have hearts of repentance before you, soft and moldable, because what culture needs is found in Christ. And Lord, I pray that we would not be at war with one another, but that we would be at war with the sin that so entangles each and every one of our hearts, whether it is individually or systemically. And so, Father, lead us and guide us. We thank you for today. May we not be hearers of your word, but may we be doers of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so today, uh, thank you for joining. Yeah, you can clap, sure. Yeah, we, we are. Thank you for joining us online. There's links to all the EP at the table. We're so proud of our worship team. 
Uh, we're so proud, of, in, in every campus, we're so proud of our worship team. And so there's links to the songs, there's links to other songs that you can see there, but also whether it's Heart Strong or All Church Prayer tonight or other steps you can take for your kids. Uh, we just want to do this entire week and do our whole lives together. So God bless you. And for those of you who are in the house, uh, you can just take a seat for a moment and the ushers are going to dismiss you row by row. And uh, it's been an honor and a privilege starting Holy Week with you. And we look forward to seeing everyone online or here. Good Friday and Easter Sunday. You can register, okay? God bless.